Where in the world did that come from? Somebody asked this on online and they posted it and we agreed that we'll meet here tonight. I'm telling you, tonight is part one. Tuesday is part two. Okay? Are we in agreement? See, it's a big thing. It's a big subject. So, Tuesday is part two. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we get into this word, take charge, Lord, we pray. Your word is sent to us to heal us, not only from physical issues, but spiritually. Jesus came, and his name is the word of God. Take this moment. May all the, all the, the smoke and the cobwebs and the blinders that exist in our minds, may the Spirit's power remove them. Let your word come through, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I purpose to do a study presentation and I pray that you will understand this study, not a sermon. I'm not proclaiming, I'm teaching. This is the question. Someone posted this online and they wanted to get the, the answer. Last week, Wednesday, you said... The Sabbath is the seventh day. Then why my church says I have to go on Sunday? That's a question from, a, from someone online. And we have online folks viewing. And we agreed, the house agreed, that, that this thing should be answered because some people, even in the house, want to get this clear. If there is one Bible, one God, one Jesus, one faith, and the Bible presents one Sabbath in the law, how is it that some people are saying, not the seventh day, but Sunday? Now, I want to make it very clear here. If you have a choice, if you have a choice to be in a car driving down a road and the car is cruising, cruising like a Benz, you're in a Benz, you're in some Rolls Royce dock, nice air condition, cruising down the road. But the end of the journey, there is a collision waiting for you. But you're cruising quietly, nice air condition, soft seats. But there is danger ahead. You're going to fall over some some precipice, some cliff, and die. But you're cruising smoothly. And another car, the wheel of the car, the tire is blown. The steering is shaking. It is rocking. It is turbulent. You're struggling to keep on course. But the end of that journey is safe. Which would you choose? Do you prefer the comfortable ride in the car to destruction or the turbulent ride? You're in a plane, you're in a plane and the plane is going through turbulence. The engine is blown, duck. It is leaning on one side. But, but, but you are told it will, it will arrive safely. But the journey isn't easy. The windows are blown. You know, passengers are all over, you know, up in the roof. They, all kind of crazy stuff. But the plane will arrive safely. But then you are in Emirates. First class. Cruising. But that plane is heading to crash. Which would you choose? The, the smooth ride? Or the bumpy one? You sure that? You, you, you don't mind... Going through that rough patch in the, in, the, in the ship that is sinking, apparently, you know, water on our side, everything in a mess. You, you know, people scampering, but you're arriving at your destination. You know that. And another one like Titanic, smooth, but heading for an iceberg. Which would you choose to be a passenger on? No, sweetheart. You don't have a choice of two and take none. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, sometimes, 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 truth will bring you into a bumpy ride. Truth will create turbulence. Truth will upset your equilibrium. Truth will disturb your life. And sometimes, untruth, error, very comfortable. Like Jesus said, the road to destruction is smooth and nice, but the road to life is straight and narrow and, and discomforting. Truth is very discomforting. The question came, Pastor, which day? Since so, so many people are saying Sunday. Let me begin by saying to the person, correction. I never said that the seventh day is the Sabbath. I never said, hello, press pause, listen, listen, listen. I never said the seventh day is the Sabbath. I never said the seventh day Sabbath should be kept. I showed you from the Bible that the Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath. I showed you that the records from Genesis all the way through down to Revelation where John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I showed you from the word of God. I did not tell you it is so. I showed you the scriptures. I showed you. It's the word of God. I've heard several Christians say that the Bible states that they are not required to keep the seven-day Sabbath and they keep Sunday as a token of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, I, 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 I want to remind such people that Jesus gave a token of his resurrection. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you testify of my death till I come. Jesus gave a token of his resurrection death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. For whenever we baptize, we baptize into his death. Huh? We are buried with him and we rise to the newness of life. Okay? So the Sunday thing, let's, let's, let's see what the word says. Tonight we will look at this important topic. Pray for me as we go along. What is the prime text that people use to argue, to assume that the Sabbath is obsolete? Prime text. I'm just using for the, looking at the prime text. Now, friends of mine, we're having a study tonight. I know we have some guests here tonight. I, all I ask you to do is just follow the study. All right? And um, whatever comes out after that, that is your decision to make your, you know, that's strictly your decision. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14 through 18. The prime text. I have siblings who are open Bible. I have siblings who belong to full gospel. I have siblings who are Catholic. Okay? I was born in a family, grew up in a family that basically went to Catholic church. I, I, was, I had first communion. I went to catechism. I had confirmation. I went to the priest and I used to confess my sins and tell him when I stole my mother milk. You know, remember the condensed milk back home, Doc? The condensed milk? You know? Uh, you all know the condensed milk? Nestle's condensed milk. You know that? And the cocoa, you mix it with the cocoa. Mommy, you remember? You mix the cocoa from the Caribbean and you go in the kitchen and you punch the hole and you have the, the tin on. You remember that, right? And when my mother told me fry fish, Fry the fish. And she go on, I, 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 take a piece of fried fish and I put it in my pocket back and I, you know, and I go on to the back and eat up my fry fish. So when I, when, when I go to church and the, the, I go to the priest and Father bless me, Father for I've sinned, I stole mommy milk and sugar and I stole some fish and I went to confess. So I know. The point is, the point is, I know about the Catholic experience. My siblings are evangelical, so I'm still Catholic. I'm the only Seventh-day Adventist in my house. So I'm not talking for or against anybody. I'm, I'm just going through the Bible. Bible. 
This is the primary text. Blotting out the handwritings of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them, triumphing over them in it. Then the, the statement comes, the advice, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance, the reality is Christ. So Paul writing to the Colossians says, all these things were actually leading you to Christ. And people interpret this to say, well, since these things were leading you to Christ, Paul says you don't have to do them anymore because if you have the real, you don't need the shadow. Now that reasoning makes sense. The reasoning makes sense. Paul is actually saying, let me just break it down. Break it down that. I am leaving, I am leaving in central Islip and I am going to, I went to the conference office last Thursday. I, I drove in America before so I can drive. So I, I, I have a car. I'm going to the president's office in, in um, Jamaica, right, Queens. I don't know the way, okay? But I have a phone with a GPS. Doc gave me a phone. Manzano, let's put on your GPS. I'll send you my location. I put on the phone and I put the GPS I have to follow the GPS. I don't know where I'm going. Right? Okay. I follow the GPS. And I go, follow the GPS, and I come back. Every time I want to go down there, I have to follow the GPS. I don't know the way. All right. Tonight, Doc is here. President is here. He tells me, after the meeting... I am taking you to the office. I don't need GPS. He, the substance is here. I don't need any direction anymore. That's all. That's what Paul is saying. That's what Paul is saying. Jesus is the substance of everything that the scriptures talked about. So if you have Jesus, you have everything. So some folks interpret this to say, since Jesus is here, we don't need the Sabbath. Because he is the rest. Let's break it down. Does this text say that the Sabbath is obsolete? Because everything else in there is not an issue. Meat, drink. Well, you could drink what you want. You could eat what you want. There's no holiday, no new moon. That's what the assumption is. Does this text say, Sabbath is obsolete. Let's go back to the text. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. The name of the subject under discussion. Ordinances. Everything that follows after fit into what people? The ordinances. If you're doing study, you're reading anything. The heading. How to make a cake. Not so? The recipe for a chocolate cake. Come on. Everything that follows comes from the recipe of a chocolate cake. Am I talking good, Doc? Come on. Now, don't move that. Don't move that. We in study. Blotting out the ordinance, the handwriting of what people? Ordinances. What is the subject matter? Ordinances. Am I, are we together? Yes. Then he goes to explain. Which were contrary to us. Took, it, took the ordinances out of the way. Yes. Nailed the ordinances yes. to the cross. 
Are, are we together? Yes. Come on, it's the Bible. Yes. And spoiled principalities and powers. He showed them openly and triumphing over them. Let no man judge you in meat or drink or in respect of holy day or new moon or Sabbath day, which are written where? In the ordinances. That's the Bible. Which blotting out, come on, you see, you must break things down. I wish I had a stick. Watch this, watch this. You simplify the thing. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances, take out everything which are a shadow of things to come. Take out everything else. And all you have, if you compress the statement, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which is a shadow. So what is the shadow? The ordinances. There is something called, there is something called biblical mathematics. So, the ordinances actually are the ceremonial laws. That's what they are. Uh, well, let me show you from the Bible. Let's go. Next, next slide. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Then Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Moses told them the words which are the ordinances. Moses wrote the ordinances. Press pause. This meeting is not about who is right or who is wrong? This meeting is not about religion, denomination. This meeting is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And I am, I am a person, I'm a preacher. Let me say this very clear. We have guests in here. Sweetheart, you took your good time to come here. My brother, you came here. You came here? You came into this house. I will give you respect. I'm not going to use a text. As who right or who wrong. No, 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 no. You and I are brethren looking at the word of God. Yes. With all due respect. You understand? Brethren, we are brethren. We believe in the same Jesus. Yes. We're looking at the word of God. And there is something people have to understand. That you could be a Christian and not understand scripture properly. Huh? A Christian. Some years ago, let me just put this in. I, I, I have a a friend back home in Trinidad, a Baptist pastor. She's a Baptist. Independent Baptist. They came to my church and they, they, um, they, they heard me preaching a funeral. And I got an invitation in my mail to come and preach in this church for Thanksgiving. A Baptist church. I didn't even know the people. When I went, the lady said, I came to your, to your church. I heard you preaching this funeral. And um, I told my elders, this guy has to preach for me. He told me that. You have to preach for me. So I went to preach for them. They invited me three years straight to preach for their Thanksgiving. Three years straight. A Baptist church. And I went, I preached for them. They loved me. I've been going there since 2005. That is how much? 18 years now. Every year they have the Thanksgiving, they invite me. They have the church dinner, they invite me. I, the pastor is my sister. Consider her my sister. She, she loves me. Okay? We have, we have respect for each other. Because we understand we are not God. Neither of us. We are on a journey and we have to pray and ask God to reveal things as we go along. Uh, are you with me, people? 
So that's one thing you need to understand, people. Don't allow your, your religion to make you disrespect people. We are all on a journey together. And I was in church one time and they had a service and they asked me to take part. Communion, Bishop. And they had wine, unfermented wine. But they had bread, which is the, like the shop bread. You know, you buy the sandwich loaf and cut them up. So that's the bread. So I'm sitting there. But in, in, in the church I go to, we have unleavened bread. Okay? So I'm sitting there. You know, I wonder if I should take you down this journey because it's a lesson. And I'm sitting there. And the minister asked me to help serve. So I'm sitting there, Bishop. I'm, I'm like, that is not the right bread. <laughs> that is not the right bread. You, you understand me? Uh, my, 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 my denominational training came in. That is not the right bread. So what do I do? But she invites me as a brother to come and serve. They call me Reverend Manzano. Yeah. When I go, she said, I represent the Seventh-day Adventist church. And then she said, when I come there, I preach, she tells the whole congregation, he is really a Baptist. We just loan him to the Adventist church. That's how close we are, Bishop. So I'm sitting there. The Lord taught me a lesson right there. White bread. That is not the body of Jesus, boy. I ain't represent. It's unleavened bread. And within a split second, it's a lesson for everybody. The Lord told me, relax. See, if I walk off the, the podium, what's going on? Relax. Then the Lord said to me, the church in Corinth was my church. But they didn't have all the doctrines right. The church in Thessalonica didn't even understand the resurrection. But that's my church. The church in Galatia got caught up. The church in Colossia got caught up with ceremonial law and all of that. They're still keeping ceremonial law. And God said, relax. They are all there. It, it has nothing to do with it. They have everything right. They are my people. And we have to understand. We have to stop treating people like because they don't understand like us or like you. Something wrong with us. We are all on a journey. And God will make sure that all his faithful children get it right before Jesus is come. God will ensure that everybody who faithfully want to know truth, he will take out the cobwebs from their mind. So I want you to feel comfortable, brother. Comfortable. Let's look at what the scripture says. Not me. Moses wrote the ordinances. That's what he did. Next text. Exodus 31 and 18. And he, God, gave unto Moses when he, God, had made an end of communion with him on Mount Sinai. Two tables of testimony. Tables of stone. Written with the finger of God. Hello. Moses wrote the ordinances. God wrote the Ten Commandments. Are we together? So there is a difference between the ordinances and the Ten Commandment law. And what was taken out and was a shadow and nailed to the cross? The ordinances. So anything that we have to forget, not do, it has to be connected to the what? Not the law. Not the law. See, if the law was nailed to the cross, the same way we have to throw away new moon and holy day, we have to throw away, thou shalt not commit adultery. We have to throw away, thou shalt not steal. We have to throw away, thou shalt not, um, don't honor your father and your mother. But we know that is relevant. So these folks... My brethren, studying, they say Paul told us 
that we shouldn't keep the Sabbath. Paul. Paul. They quote one person. I want to show you something from the word. Will God use Paul alone to say that the Sabbath is obsolete? God operates from a divine perspective. God has an operational way. And listen to how it works. Text. Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. Everybody read. One witness shall not rise up against a man for an iniquity or for a sin. In any sin that he commits. At the mouth of two witnesses. Or at the mouth of three witnesses. Shall every matter be established. God has a principle. That anytime God is dealing with something. You need two or three witnesses. All through the Bible. You have two or three witnesses. The Bible says in the beginning. God said let us make man. God function in a plurality. When Moses went up on the mount. In fact when God called Moses. To go to tell Pharaoh let my people go. He didn't go alone. He sent Aaron and Miriam. Three. When Moses went up on the mount to get the law, he had Joshua. If he came with the law alone, they could say, he chiseled it. When Jesus was baptized, the Bible says, the heaven opened and the dove came and the father spoke. God always has two or three witnesses. When check your New Testament, Jesus has two brothers who wrote James and Jude. They got two people who did not follow Jesus, Mark and Luke. And you got three people who followed Jesus. Two or three. And the Bible says, fast forward, the last message to this world. It's not one angel. You got three angels coming and saying the message in the presence of two or three witnesses. And anytime Jesus has something serious to say, he says, verily, verily. Whenever he says, verily, verily, this is done. You guys need to bring your friends out here. Stop cheating the people who need to hear this gospel. Stop cheating them. Stop cheating. In the presence of Moses said that. Okay. Next text. Matthew 18, 15 to 16. Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him what he did. We are in church tonight. Tell him what he did between you and him. If he shall hear you, you gained your brother. But if your brother does not hear you, this is Jesus. We have Old Testament God telling Moses, two and three witnesses. Now you have Jesus saying, if he doesn't hear you, take two more. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word must be as you cannot build a case with your word alone. You can't. You must have a witness. I was going to say something. But... No, America, America has a big issue going on now with your president, your ex-president. They bring in all kinds of charges. Nothing could be proven unless they have witnesses. Yeah. Have a witness. You must have witnesses. Second Corinthians 13.1 Paul is saying now this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses. He said I came once you didn't listen. 
You came, I came twice, you didn't listen. The third time I'm coming, and God is going to use my third appointment with you as a witness against you. So God has a divine principle about how God works. Are we in church? Now the New Testament writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, Jude, Paul has no support. You cannot find another New Testament writing outside of Paul to corroborate that the Sabbath is not to be kept. Zero. All the writings that are quoted about the law being abolished is Paul. All the writings about we're not under the law is Paul. So then we're assuming that God changed his pattern. But God said in the presence of Paul has to get one of them. Just one bishop. If Paul gets, gets Peter, we good. If Paul got James, he's good. But, but John says, sin is the transgression of the law. So John doesn't back up that. James says, if we offend in one point, we're guilty of all. So James doesn't back him up. Peter ain't got nothing to say. And all Mark and Luke dealing with is the life of Jesus. No one. Let's go on. This is, this is hard stuff. Let's go on. Watch this. He doesn't only have witnesses. He doesn't have an argument. Paul wrote Colossians during the first imprisonment in Rome. That was between AD 60 to 62. He wrote those words. Let no man judge you in meat or drink. He wrote those words. Between AD 60 and 62. Watch this. Paul wrote to Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. For I, Paul, am ready to be offered up. He's going to die. I fought a good fight. I'm on my way out. He wrote that in AD 65. Are we together? So he wrote Colossians in AD 62. He's going to die in AD 65. Okay, let's go. We're doing, what we're doing? We're doing biblical mathematics. Okay? And the nice thing about biblical mathematics, it's easy to resolve. In Luke chapter 21, and verse 20 to 22, listen to these words. And when you shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, know that desolation is nigh. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which is in the midst of it depart. Next, next slide. The destruction of Jerusalem is AD 70. Bishop, we're doing the maths, right? Then let them which are in Judea flee. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on Sabbath day. Just break it down. Just break it down. Paul wrote to the Colossians. When people, do we have that there? 62. Paul is martyred in when? 65. Jesus told them, I expect that you would be keeping Sabbath in 70. Long after Paul. So we have to ask ourselves, do we believe or accept Paul said the Sabbath should be changed and you believe a dead Paul or a living Jesus who said it should be kept. Now you tell me something. Do you believe the dead man told you not to do it or do you believe the living man said to do it? Uh, uh, are, we, are we understanding people? Yes. We understanding? Yes. Jesus said, I expect you'd be keeping Sabbath 
all AD 70. Paul wrote AD 62. He's dead. He's dead in 65. And Jesus said, I expect five years after Paul dead, you are still keeping his Sabbath. Mercy. Nothing sweet like the gospel. Well, let's go again. So we have number one. God says it must be two or three witnesses. We have number two. Paul is gone. Jesus said, I expect you're still doing it. So that Paul is outdated. Jesus' words will go further than Paul's words. Let's go again. Matthew chapter 17. Verse 4 and 6. Bishop, you're glad you come to church tonight, huh? President saying, boy, this message is interesting, boy. You know? If, if, you ever, if you ever had an inclination that the Sabbath is, is irrelevant, it, hello, you have to double check now. Because we have pastors leaving and going out and saying the Sabbath is obsolete. Pastors in the faith. They need to come and sit in my class. They need to do over their BA. Huh? Let's go. Watch this. Watch this. Then answered Peter. They're up on the mount, transfiguration. Moses and Elijah is there. And Peter said, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. That means that they're equal. And the Bible says, the father overheard <laughs> and interrupt immediately. The Bible said, listen, while he yet speak, that means God the Father not even waiting for him to end the sentence. What God is actually saying. Anytime you put somebody on the same status with Jesus. I am not even waiting for you to end the sentence. Anytime you elevate a man to Jesus level. I am not even waiting for you to end the sentence. The Bible says a cloud came down. The throne came down. Have respect for my son. There is no name equal to his name. The Bible says, while you speak, a bright cloud overshadow. And I like to look into it. I could hear God saying, shut up. That, listen, that is almost destruction there, you know. Love of God descended and hear the Father. This don't make no tabernacle for anybody else. This singular, specific, direct. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the last three words is what you need to pay attention to. Hear ye him. So as far as what God is concerned, anything God has to say to us, Jesus makes the final statement. As far as God is concerned, yes. you can go wrong, probably, listening to Moses. You might go wrong listening to Jeremiah. Yeah. You might go wrong listening to Paul. But you could never go wrong listening to Jesus. Right. Jesus says, any man follow me will never walk in darkness. Mercy. Mercy. When they lifted their eyes, just to drive home the point. There's Moses and Elijah on the mount. God, de God deleted them. Yes. Deleted them out of the mountain. So you're not confused. Right. So they couldn't get up and say, which one, Lord? Yes. They, met, they saw Jesus only. So God says, Jesus is the one who makes the final statement for me. And just to drive home the point... You have one text in the presence of two or three witnesses. Everything. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse places, spake in times past unto us, to us by the fathers, the prophets. He used, he, he used to talk to us through the prophets. But in these last days, he had spoken to us by his son. 
One preacher said, when you, when you exegete this text in the Greek, Jesus is the exegesis of God. If you see me, you see the Father. Whatever Jesus says, nobody can change that. He's the full stop, the destination, the climax, the pinnacle. Once Jesus says it, you cannot go and ask God to change it. Jesus has the last say. Last say. Let's go again. Are we in school tonight? Is this good stuff? Friends, are you still with me? We all right so far? Yeah, as I said before, truth can be like a bumpy ride. Turbulent, but you're safe. You're safe. Watch this. Every time I preach, I go to the Bible, God reveals new stuff. The Lord showed me something. He said, he said, go, check this out. What's some words? Just roll them for me, sweetheart, as we go along. Matthew chapter 5. 21 and 22. You have heard that being said by them of old, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you. That's the authority of Jesus. You have heard that it has been said, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you. Next slide. You have heard. It has been said in old time, don't commit adultery. But I say unto you. You see, the people who wrote before are the messengers of the king. But now the king has arrived himself. Next one. Again, you have heard it had been said by my messengers, but I say unto you, swear not. Next slide. You have heard it been said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say Unto you. Next slide. Roll them. You have heard it has been said. Love your neighbor. Hate your enemy. But I say unto you. Come on people. Come on people. You have heard. You have heard. In all these texts. Jesus is demonstrating his authority. And he is quoting law. He has the authority to interpret. Clarify. And amend. You know why? He is the law giver. Amen. Amen. You have heard. It has been said. But I say. And when Jesus says, nobody could come over and say, but I say. The only one. Not Paul. Not Moses. Nobody else could say above Jesus. All the texts we read, there is no text that says, you have heard. It has been said. The Sabbath should be kept. But I say, after I die, you don't have to keep it. In fact, he said, after I die and I ascend, about 37 years after, I expect you to be keeping my Sabbath. And John on Patmos, AD 100, still keeping. God does not send critical messages by one voice. You must have backup. You know why? Any little fly by night could get up and say, God told me. Anybody could go about saying, God told me. Jim Jones came up and said, God told me to carry you all to Guyana. They are dead. David Koresh said, God told me to carry you all. Waco, Texas, dead. Anytime you have a man coming up, God told me you cannot trust him. He must have backup. Paul has no backup. In the presence and in the mouth of two or three witnesses, Every word must be established. Jesus said, Matthew 24, Pray ye not. Pray that your flight be not in winter 
on the Sabbath day in AD 70. Jesus said that. You know what's interesting? Jesus is the final statement from God. But God said, in the presence of, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, Jesus alone could have said, I expect you to be keeping my Sabbath. But God has a principle in the mouth of two or three. So put it up. Jesus said, I pray that your flight be not in to a Sabbath in AD 70. He said it. But just to keep the principle alive, he impressed Paul, the same Paul, to say it. Hebrews chapter 4. Read it. There remain it, therefore, a rest to the people of God. Hebrews 4 9. He that entereth into his rest has ceased from his own works as God did in the first creation week. So Jesus has, Jesus has authority to say it. But Jesus said, just to keep the principle alive, I will impress Paul to say it. And just to keep, Jesus has witnesses. And he punctuated, he said, okay, you don't want to believe me? I let the last apostle say it. Revelation chapter 1. Chapter 3, sorry. I, John, yes. your brother and companion, tribulation. I was on the Isle of Patmos on AD 100. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Jesus has backup even though he don't need it. Where on earth did that come from? But it didn't come from Paul. It didn't come from God. It didn't come from Jesus. It didn't come from any of the apostles. God does not operate solo. Not even the Godhead operates solo. Trinity. Where on earth did that come from? Paul didn't say it. Jesus didn't say it. Question is, question is tonight, if the Bible does not support the idea that the Sabbath in the law which was written in stone, not the ordinances, the ordinances had Sabbath days. The Passover was a Sabbath. Pentecost was a Sabbath. The Day of Atonement was a Sabbath. The Feast of Weeks was a Sabbath. All of them, they had seven Sabbaths. When Jesus was crucified, the Passover week, the, 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 um, the, the, um, the week of, of, of unleavened bread, the whole week was Sabbath. God has Sabbath days. But when Jesus died on the cross, everything pointed to him. That was the GPS. But the law, remember, I brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord that brought you out of Egypt and out of, the, out of bondage. You have any God for me. You can't do away with that. You can't do away with don't make idols. You cannot do away with don't take my name in vain. You cannot do away with that. So you can't use Paul to move the fourth commandment. You can't. Okay? Now I'll ask you. Anybody has an issue with any of these things? Like it doesn't make sense? Makes sense. We, sh we, we should follow Jesus. And the Bible says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Paul's custom was keeping Sabbath. Where on earth did this come from? The question tonight is as we close part one. Now that you have heard now that you have seen that the Bible says differently from many of our interpretations, what will you do? I told you before, following God is not complicated. 
following God and what God has said is making a choice. God has revealed this to me. I don't know how I will do this. I cannot understand how I will do it. This thing has just changed my whole life. All God wants for you to do is say, Lord, I accept what you say. That's it. That's all. I accept it. Give me the power. Give me the willingness to do it. That's it. It's not about, you mean I had to give up my party and I have to leave. No, 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 no. That's not what serving God is about. Serving God is about God reveal this to me. God requires this of me. Lord, give me the grace to do it. I choose what you have said. I accept it. This thing is, this thing is like traveling on a plane with an engine blown. You just blew my engine. You just, you just, you just blew my time. My, my whole life is, but Lord, this is the right thing. Give me the grace to do it. Is there anybody here? Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Is there anybody here? Want to say tonight, Lord, give me the grace. This is new. This is different. This is not what I know. There is something called deadly devotion. Stay with me, church. Friends of mine, there is something called deadly devotion. Paul had it. Persecuting the church. Doing all kinds of stuff. Believing he's right, but he's so wrong. Something called deadly devotion. You could be very devoted to something, but that thing is not right. When God comes and calls you, he says to you, this is the way, walk ye in it. I'm calling for somebody here tonight who will say, this message is an eye-opener. I never saw this before. And you want to ask God for the grace to help you to understand even more and give you the grace to be obedient to this. Is there anybody here who wants to say this tonight? Just raise your hand to heaven. Anybody? Is there a guest here? This is new to you, but you want to tell God, I accept it. I accept it. Anyone? Do you accept this as God's word? Let me, let me, just, let me just put it another way. Anyone want to say, I accept that as what? As God's word. Okay? That's God's word. God's word. Accept it. That's God's word. That's God's word.